Welcome to our guests that we have here with us today. As you can see, there's quite a few people missing. We've got several families traveling. We've got almost 20 people on the road this weekend, so uh, and hopefully everybody will be able to arrive back safely next Sabbath and uh, be able to reconvene with us. And of course, we've got our older folks that just have a hard time getting, getting things together every Sabbath day. Uh, Willie's getting older. Ruthie's getting older. Elva's already old. <laughs> And I know she wouldn't mind me saying that, knowing Elva, if you ever have a chance to chat with her. If you ever get a chance to go out and visit Elva White, you are in for a real treat. I mean, she may sound like she's, you know, dying on the phone when you call to talk to her, but you start talking to her on the phone, it's like most everybody who's not feeling well, you get them on the phone, start talking to them, all of a sudden the, the energy level starts rising, and the next thing you know, they're laughing and cackling and having a grand old time, enjoying everything about life. But if you ever have a chance to go out and visit Elva, you are in for a real treat. Uh, she is really quite a character. Uh, her mind is all there. It's just her poor body is not able to make things work at 93 or whatever she is now, 94. But she's still, she's still a, a bundle of energy when you get her mind going and mind clicking. She, and she loves to talk. So entertain yourself sometime. Go out and visit Elva White. <laughs> she likes cupcakes too, by the way. Well, the bo college bowl games only have one game left for all of you college football game aficionados. On this Monday, January 11th, I think at about 5 or 5.30 p.m., Alabama and Clemson universities will play for the national championship of college football. There's a bowl game each year that's played on New Year's Day. It's always been played on New Year's Day as far as I can remember. The bowl game's called the granddaddy of them all. It's the Rose Bowl. The Rose Bowl is played in Pasadena, California, and if I'm not mistaken, it's one of the oldest bowl games played for the national bowl games. Let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 7 as we begin here today. Proverbs chapter 7. On New Year's Day, many years ago, actually in 1929, New Year's Day, 1929, see if there's any aficionados in the room. Who played in the Rose Bowl? Anybody think? Georgia Tech played the University of California, Berkeley, in the Rose Bowl on January 1st, 1929. In that infamous Rose Bowl game, a young man named Roy Regals recovered a fumble for Cal near the end of the first half. Roy picked up the loose ball and ran for 65 yards toward the goal line. Unfortunately, he got bumped a couple of times when he picked up the ball, got confused, and he was running toward the wrong goal line. Right before he crossed the goal line to score a touchdown for Georgia Tech, one of his teammates, Benny Lom, tackled him at about the three or four yard line, brought him down to the ground. Several plays later, several plays later, Cal had to punt from their own end zone. And when they punted from the end zone, what happened is uh, the kick got blocked and Georgia Tech scored a safety. Two points for Georgia Tech. That totally demoralized the University of California, Berkeley, as a result of this fumble pickup that Roy Regals had. After the play, they took a break for halftime. Regals was so distraught that he had to be talked into returning back into the game, even though he was the captain of the team. His coach, Nibs Price, pleaded with him to get his act together and get back out on the field. Roy told, Roy, Roy said, Coach, I can't do it. I've ruined you. I've ruined myself. I've ruined the University of California. I couldn't face that crowd to save my life. Coach Price just responded by saying, Roy, get up and get back out there. The game is only half over. The All-American center did go back out, and he played an absolutely outstanding second half. He blocked one of Georgia Tech's extra points, or one of their punts. From that day on, Roy Regals was branded Wrong Way Regals or Wrong Way Roy, and it stuck with him to the day he died. If you think about it, there are many people who live their lives that way. They're going the wrong way, really pushing hard, going the wrong way because they've lost sight of 
or they got turned around like Roy did, or they simply never had a goal. Adam Stanley, a religious author, once made this observation. Many people are what you might call directionally challenged. They don't know where they're going, and they don't have any goals to help them get there. They just wander through life, expecting that everything's going to turn out all right. Just putting one foot in front of the other, and it's going to happen. And that's kind of the picture that we're going to get here in Proverbs 7 as we start reading here. Solomon is musing. Solomon is actually trying to educate his son. He's sitting on the front of his home watching a young man wandering down the street. Let's pick it up here, Proverbs 7 and verse 1. Proverbs 7, verse 1, Solomon writes, he said, My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. In other words, absorb them, internalize them, make them a part of your being. Solomon is advising how his son can live life and enjoy life. Say to wisdom, verse 4, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin. So we see Solomon considering wisdom and understanding as very key to the successes in life. But look at this transition, verse 5, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. In other words, make sure you have a focus and a direction in your life and that you are not lacking of judgment. And he uses an immoral woman as an analogy for the trouble of life. Solomon then gives an example about how this can go so bad for an individual and for us, without proper judgment and without proper direction in our lives. Verse 6, For at the window of my house I looked through my lattice and saw among the, among the simple, I perceived among the youths a young man devoid of understanding. He saw this young man walking aimlessly down the street, no direction in life, just wandering around. Passing along the street near her corner, and he took the path to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and in the dark of the night. So now he's sneaking around through town, probably going someplace he knows he probably shouldn't be going, but he's going there anyway. In this picture, we see a young man who's out walking aimlessly through town at night. The kid doesn't seem to care about where he's going, and he really doesn't seem to care about where he's going to end up. He's just going out to have a good time, maybe. He has no specific direction. He's just wandering along the road as it's getting dark. He's out taking in the sights of the city, maybe, because there's got, he's got nothing else better to do. So he said, maybe I should just go for a stroll and see what I can find. But he's apparently in the wrong part of town at the wrong time of day, and he meets up with the wrong kind of woman. Let's continue. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was dressed to kill. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside and at times in the open square, lurking at every corner, looking for the next guy she could lure into her den. This woman knew how to get men to join her. She knew how to, knew how to dress seductively. She perfumed herself up, and she said all of the right things because she knew young men liked to be puffed up. A talented hooker. So she caught him and kissed him. And with an impudent face, she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I've paid my vows. In other words, I did those things that are obvious that make me look like I'm more pious and like I'm more religious in the public's eye. I've done the right things. I went and paid my dues. I paid my peace offerings. I paid my vows. The easy stuff. 
And the stuff that's obvious that everybody else can see. So that she can then go out and live a life of total immorality behind the scenes. She then kisses up to this young man, making him feel important. So I came out to meet you, she says, diligently to seek your face. I found you. You're really special, dude. I like you. I like the way you dress. Matter of fact, I like the way you walk. I'll bet you're really something. I picked you over all the other men in this town. You're hot. And I'm going to make you have a good time tonight. I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored evenings, uh, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I've got the finest linens on my bed, silk. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Or you're really going to like what I've done for you. I've got this place set up to treat you like a king. I'm going to make you feel more special than you've ever felt before in your life. Wait until you get into bed with me. Verse 18, come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. Everything a young man wants to hear, that's enticing to a young man with all those hormones raging in his system. He's got no destination. He's got no plan for life. He's got no direct purpose. Hey, why not? Anybody in their right mind would take up on this, wouldn't they? That's what he's probably telling himself. She comes out to meet him. She's a good-looking woman, and she's showing very special interest in this young man. She makes him feel really good about himself. And everybody likes to feel good about themselves, don't they? Everybody. And since this young man has nothing better to do with his time, he goes with her, and he spends time with this adulterous woman, as we're going to see. She created his direction for him because he didn't have one. But where will it lead? Verse 19. For my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He got on a plane. He's going to Europe. He's going to be gone for weeks. He took a big bag of money with him. He's got money to spend. He's got money to burn. He's going out to buy things. He's going out to negotiate. He won't be back for a long time, so you don't have to worry about my husband. He's taking the bag of money with him and will come home on the appointed day. We're good. <coughs> this is a way of life for this woman. She got her husband in town when she needs a husband, and when he's gone, she's got anybody and anything she wants. And this unsuspecting young man gets sucked into her dungeon, dungeon, into her ploys, into her den of iniquity. Verse 21. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. She made him make a mistake. She made him do something he might not have normally done, but he's doing it now. With her flattering lips, she seduced him, and it worked. After all, if somebody says the right things, they can get our attention and get us to go down a path we might not normally go down. Immediately, he went after her. As I used to say to friends, like a dog in heat. But the Bible says, as an ox goes after the slaughter, as a fool to the correction of the stocks. This guy's getting led down a path. He has no idea what he's being led into. Till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare. He did not know it would cost his life. In other words, he will live to seriously regret this decision that he's making this night because he has no direction. He doesn't know where he's going. He's got no plan on how to get there, so any destination is going to work out just fine. But how did he end up in such a dangerous arrangement, in such a dangerous predicament? We can hear this story. The story's in the Bible. We can read this story. It's like almost like an X-rated novel, almost, in some ways. And you think to yourself, how could that happen to say, you know what, that can happen to any one of us sitting here in this room. Any single one of us sitting here in this room, this exact same scenario could happen to each and every one of us. If we're not tuned in to God. If we're not tuned into his way of life. And if we don't have him as our primary source of desires, we heard in the sermonette. 
This happened because, as Solomon tells us, this young man lacked judgment. He didn't use good wisdom. He didn't use good judgment. Let me share another true story with you. On February 6th, 2007, just a few years ago, three of the Indiana Pacers professional basketball team got into serious trouble at a bar in Indianapolis, Indiana. They were at a bar called the Eight Seconds Saloon in downtown Indianapolis at 2.15 in the morning when a fight broke out. Gunshots were fired. Bad stuff happened. Some people said the papers, Pacers were in the middle of it all and the Pacers said they had nothing to do with it. But one commentator noted that nothing good can ever come from being out at a bar at that time in the morning, 2.15 in the morning. As his commentator put it, if these guys had wanted to avoid getting into trouble, they should have been at home in bed. This was a lack of total judgment. And just like the foolish young man of Proverbs 7, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong kind of people. And bad things happened. Let's go on to Proverbs 8 now. Proverbs 7 is a lesson Solomon is sharing with his sons, trying to teach them about life, trying to get them to focus and understand what's, what, what's important about wisdom and understanding and judgment, decisions that we make. He's telling them a story because he wants to drive home a special insight into life that he wants them to grasp. But what lesson did Solomon actually have in mind? Why did he tell about a foolish boy meandering down the middle of a street being distracted by a hooker and a harlot? Well, he told this story because he wanted his sons to understand the value of knowing where they are going. Solomon points the, paints the picture of a foolish young man being seduced by a loose woman. And the reason he is so easily swayed into her bedroom is because this fellow doesn't seem to care where he's at or who he's with. There's no purpose. Because if he had purpose, he wouldn't have done either. Then Solomon contrasts that with the story of some place they should want to be and someone they should want to be metaphorically. Let's pick it up in Proverbs 8 and verse 1. Proverbs 8, verse 1. It says, does not wisdom cry out? When you hear a story like this, he says, doesn't wisdom just come screaming at you? Doesn't understanding lift up her voice? She takes her stand on the top of the high hill beside the way where the paths meet, right out in the open where everybody can see her. She cries out by the gates at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the doors. Unlike the seductor of adulteress lurking in the shadows, sneaking around town in dark, wisdom and understanding are yelling from every good vantage point that they can find, trying to get our attention, trying to get us to see, trying to get us to know, trying to get us to understand. As Solomon said, make wisdom like your sister, tied together, do anything for each other, and understanding like one of your dear relatives. Wisdom and understanding are yelling from all these points, all out in the open for everybody to hear. To you, verse 4, O men, I call, and my voice is to the, to the sons of men. O you simple ones, understand prudence, and you fools, be of an understanding heart. Pay attention. The New Living Translation reads like this for verse 5. Let me read verse 5 again from the New Living Translation. You simple people, use good judgment. You foolish people, show some understanding. Then he goes on in verse 6. Listen, for I will speak of excellent things, and from the opening of my lips will come right things. For my mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is, in the abom is an abomination to my lips. In other words, Wisdom and understanding bring forth the finest things of life. 
And most of us, I don't think, think about these two things sufficiently. Because if we did, our lives would change. Because we would understand how important it is to have wisdom, to make the right judgments, to have the understanding about what it is that we're involved with, what it is that God is involved with in our lives, and what he's trying to do with us, each one of us individually. And in verse 8 he said, All the words of my mouth are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. <coughs> the foolish man meanders along in places he doesn't belong. In places he shouldn't be. Because he has no specific, specific direction or objective in life. By contrast, the wise man has purpose and direction. He doesn't stumble into the harlot's bedroom because he does care where he goes. He does care who he fellowships with, who he associates with, because he knows the quality of the people that he associates with will have an a, a, a distinct impact on his life. <clears throat> As we've been hearing for two years now, we can't meddle, we can't mingle with things that are not good and not expect them to not affect us. It's an impossibility. And this is what Solomon's trying to point out. Again, this individual has a direction and purpose because he does care who he's fellowshipping with and, and mixing and mingling with. He does care where he goes. Some people call this the PATH principle. P-A-T-H, the PATH principle. In the path principle, this is what one can conclude. We know that in driving, the direction you are going determines the destination at which you will arrive. Sounds almost too dumb to be profound, too simple to have meaning. If I want to go to San Francisco and go east on I-80, how long will it take me to get to San Francisco? I will never get there. I may end up in Hackensack, New Jersey, but not San Francisco, California, because the direction that I'm going cannot possibly get me there. This is a powerful point about our lives. The direction we are going <clears throat> will determine the destination at which we ultimately arrive. And virtually everything that we're doing in our lives affect that direction. Now, if that's true, when I drive a car or take a hike, it is certainly true in how I live my life. If I want to get somewhere with my life, I'd better have a direction in mind to get me there. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Too many people in life just don't know where they're going. They have no specific destination for their lives, and so one day they'll possibly end up going someplace they may go, they're going to regret. And it may lead them to a place that they will regret for the rest of their lives, like that young man in Proverbs 7. Solomon says, don't do that. Don't live life like that. Think about what is your destination and think about what you've got to do to get yourself pointed in that direction. Have a destination. Know where you're going and do what it takes to get there. So what kind of destination should we choose? Well, since you're all sitting here today during church services on the Sabbath, I believe that means you want to go where God wants you to be. Paul tells us here in Ephesians that there is some good news in all this for us. He knows the direction we should take our lives. Let's read just one verse here in Ephesians 2, verse 10. Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Some translations have it as masterpiece, which is the more appropriate translation. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Do we understand what that passage of Scripture says? We are God's masterpiece. <coughs> like Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, his masterpiece. Like Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa or The Last Supper, masterpieces. Masterpieces of life. Masterpieces of creativity. That's what God says you and I are to him. His masterpieces. We were created with Jesus Christ as our captain for good works. To do good things. Which has already been prepared for us. Jesus Christ said that's why we're called. God has already planned out the direction our lives should take. And he... God and Jesus Christ are going to make sure we follow the path. See, we can get off the path at times. We can take I-80 East and fully intend to go to San Francisco and we are not going to get there until something changes. God is the exact same way. I said, I want to go to your kingdom. I want to be in, make it to eternal life. I want to live like Jesus Christ lived, but I'm going east on 80 when I want to go to San Francisco. So how does God turn it around? Well, we heard that in a sermon a few weeks ago. He corrects us. He disciplines us. He changes our route. Let's flip over to James chapter 1. As we have learned recently... God's plan for our life is tailored to our needs and our desires, and he is at the controls. James 1. So if I want the best destination for my life, I should build a destination around what God says he wants and with his encouragement. Because we know that God says if we take the path that he wants us to follow, he will provide us every means to get to where he wants us to go. Every means including the encouragement, the strength, the, the tenacity to get there. But how does this work? Well, Solomon in Proverbs 7 starts off by talking to his son about relationships. The young man, because of a lack of direction, developed a relationship with a harlot. That was his relationship. You can't hardly miss her. <laughs> Solomon also tells us God's wisdom is like a woman out in the street shouting and waving her arms. You can't miss her if you're looking for her. If you're trying to find her. If we believe the Bible, wisdom and understanding are readily there for our taking. Develop a relationship with her. As we are told by Solomon, make wisdom like your sister. In the same way, God's wisdom is easy to find if we bother to look for it, and more importantly, ask for it. Look at James 1. Let's all read a very familiar passage of Scripture. James 1, beginning in verse 5. James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. That's a promise. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. And again, as we've been hearing for the past several months, we've got to look to God, believe God in Jesus Christ, trust God, Trust Jesus Christ. Know that he is in charge of our lives. He's in charge of everything. He's, in, he's at the controls. And he is ultimately going to make things go the way he wants them to go. As we've been learning, we cannot arrive at our life's purpose by starting with a focus on ourselves. <clears throat> Again, like we heard in the sermonette, if the focus is on us, we can't possibly reach life's purposes because life's purposes are not us it's not about us it's about everybody else we're going to affect on this planet people that we know people that we don't even know 
As we get ready to close, let's go to Philippians chapter 13. No, chapter 3. Philippians 3, there is no 13. We must begin with God, our creator. We exist only because he willed us to exist. We were made by God, for God. And until we understand that, life will never make sense. It is only in God and Jesus Christ that we discover our origin, our identity, our meaning, our purpose, our significance, and yep, our destiny. It's amazing what happens when we start developing a relationship with God. And more importantly, and I say more importantly because that's the path to God, the relationship with Jesus Christ. I have been like a broken record for two years now talking about that. Maybe to the chagrin of some of you. The reason I'm doing that is because it's incredibly, crucially important. Without a relationship with Jesus Christ, you do not cannot have a relationship with God. It is impossible. Every other path that we choose leads to a dead end. As Christians, we know God has a destiny for us. The Bible tells us God called every single person sitting in this room with a specific purpose. I don't know what that is. You don't know what that is, maybe. God does. And the more we acquiesce to him, the more we acquiesce to his lead, the more we ask him to actually take control and lead our lives by giving us the wisdom and the judgment and the understanding we need to make the right choices, the easier it's going to be to figure out what that purpose is. That's what Paul believed. And he used this as a motivator to himself and in our lives as well. Here in Philippians 3, he is talking about pressing on toward the goal. And ultimately attaining it. Let's begin in Philippians 3 and verse 12. Philippians 3 verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, I, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended or laid hold of it, but one thing I, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I don't drag myself down with all the garbage from my past. I let it go. And I keep pressing forward with everything that God and Jesus Christ are telling me it's standing in my future. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Paul was convinced that nothing else in this life compared with what God had in store in his life. He wasn't clearly sure what it was. He knew God had called him to be an apostle, and as the apostle, he said, I want you to go out and preach and teach and suffer whenever you have to suffer, but you just keep preaching and teaching, and I'll make sure you get to the right people at the right time with the right words, and you will achieve and accomplish exactly what I've called you to do, and I will bless you for that. And Paul kept moving. So much so that he left everything else behind and he strained and pushed hard toward God's destiny in his life every single day of his life. When we have such a destination set in our minds, think about this. We'll just naturally prune away every relationship and every activity that hinders or bogs down our commitment to that goal because we know it's going to get in our way. We know it's going to slow us down. We know it's going to stop us possibly from even getting to the goal. So let's revisit what we've learned so far today. One, the direction we are going determines the destination at which we arrive. God has already established that best direction for our lives. He made a plan for us. 
So if I want what is best in my life, then I want to build my life around his plan, not mine. And I discover that plan by asking for wisdom and understanding. Let's close with Isaiah 44. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 44. Before I read Isaiah 44, let me ask a couple of questions. What if I've made a bad decision? A really bad decision. What if I haven't included God in my plans? What if I've messed up things so badly that there doesn't seem to be any way of fixing them? I think we're going to see that God is the God of do-overs. God is the God of new beginnings. I hearken back yet once again to Romans 8.28. I'm not going to turn there. You probably all can recite it verbatim. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Brethren, this is a very real part of the Bible. God works things out. Everything. He's totally in control. Look at Isaiah 44 now. Earlier in this chapter, Isaiah discussed the coming of the Spirit of God. He was actually talking about it. As well as the foolishness of idolatry. Let's pick it up in Isaiah 44 and verse 21. I'm going to read this last passage from the New Living Translation, so follow along if you'd like or just listen. Isaiah 44, verse 21. Pay attention, O Jacob, for you are my servant, O Israel. I, the Lord, made you, and I will not forget you. I have swept away your sins like a cloud. I have scattered your offenses like the morning mist. O return to me, for I have paid the price to set you free. Sing, O heavens. For the Lord has done this wondrous thing. Shout for joy, O depths of the earth. Break into song, O mountains and forests and every tree. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and is glorified in Israel. Like I just stated, God is the God of beginning again. The God of do-overs. I love that term. Do-over. Start over, begin again, clean the slate, get moving down the right path again. That's the way God treats it. As long as we repent, come to him and say, God, I really don't want to live that way of life anymore. Help me. Give me wisdom. Give me understanding. And help me to move forward positively. He takes our failures, our faults. And once we repent, he removes them, replacing them with a clean new slate. You have the potential of doing that every single day. How cool is that? I can mess up today, repent of it, get a clean slate tomorrow, start fresh. Let's go back to the rest of the story. Roy Regals had failed his team with that fumble return at the Rose Bowl in 1929. It led to his safety, which gave Georgia Tech two points that day. When they went into the locker room at halftime that day, they were at an eight-point deficit. They were down eight to zero. Roy Regals, after some coaxing, went back out and played the second half in outstanding fashion. But guess what? The final score of that game was eight to seven. Cal lost the Rose Bowl that year by one point. The two points that Georgia Tech got off Roy's crazy fumble return cost them the game. It demoralized Roy. 
It demoralized the team, and they had to pick up the pieces and move on. In spite of that, Roy Regals rebounded in his life and went on to a very productive and inspiring career. He inspired others with his courage and attitude, which was portrayed by this statement. If you go, to the, wrong, if you go the wrong way sometimes in your life, you can always turn it around. God is always there to help. On August 9th, 1991, when Roy was 83 years old and stricken with Parkinson's disease, Roy Regals, Wrong Way Roy, was inducted into the Rose Bowl Hall of Fame. His award was accepted by his son David, a Sacramento attorney, as Roy sat there in the wheelchair. Although the majority of those at the ceremony weren't born when Roy Regal's wrong way run took place on January 1st, 1929, they gave that old Golden Bear captain as loud a cheer as anybody else got that same day. The wrong way had finally turned out right, just as it can in our lives. God will see to that. Have a great Sabbath.